to our third and final panel of the Spectators Energy Summit, sponsored by National Grid. We're going to and start asking some pretty difficult questions about whether green technology is really capable of meeting the demands of our pretty energy intensive economy. After all, many of the um, of the UK's most polluting sectors are crucial to sustaining our everyday life. Heat amounts to something like a third of UK's greenhouse gas emissions, and most homes in the country still use natural gas for heating or for cooking. It's going to take some switching to change people to a different form of heat. Now, if these household households don't start using lower carbon sources, it's pretty unlikely that the 2050 net zero target is going to be met. So from industry to homeowners, how does society shift to green technology? Is it realistic to expect them to do so? And can we really start to ban people from putting in gas heaters and gas ovens in their home? Now, with a slight change to the scheduled lineup, so Lady Verma won't be able to join us, but instead we will be joined by Dr. Nina Skrupska, who's head of the Renewable Energy Association, Lord Debden, who's chairman of the Climate Change Committee, and also by Tony Green at National Grid. I'm going to ask all of our panelists to have some opening remarks, then we'll enter some general discussion, and then finally we'll take some questions from you. So if you can think of questions while they're talking, just email them via the, the um, Zoom technology or send them to events at spectator.co.uk and we'll put your questions to the panelists in a few moments. But first, can I ask Dr. Nina Skrupska to start us off? Hello and, and good morning. Yeah, it's a very interesting question that's been posed. Can green technologies meet the demands of an energy intensive society? Well, I think if we look at power and the progress to date, we can understand whether green technologies can meet this. And it's been a success story for electricity so far. Uh, I think many people who already have heard the sessions earlier will be aware of some of the statistics, but let me rattle through a few for power. So renewables already provide over 35% of electricity demand every year, and this continues to increase. And indeed, the first quarter of this year, we were around about 47%, up from 35.9% last year, this time. And if you are going to, whether you believe um, renewables can do this alone, well, we believe as from the, the sector that uh, renewable power can surpass fossil fuel generation as soon as 2023. And then if you add other low carbon technologies, that proportion rises to around 62.1% of this compared to the previous year. So if you add a nuclear, and it's not a case of if green technologies can meet our energy demands, they can, but I believe it's how green technologies can be supported to meet that demand. So if we want to generate more, you know, we need an extra 100 gigawatts to meet that 2050 net zero carbon target, that national grid with the overall energy demand climbing. So how can this all be done? Well, I think everybody's aware that technology prices for wind and solar have come down, but there's so many more other additional technologies. And as Fraser mentioned earlier, heat and transport and uh, tackling our energy intensive uh, businesses, that sector will be the real challenge going forward. But if we can learn from what's been done for power, and even if we overlook the stop start policy cycles that we've seen over the last decade, I, I'm optimistic that we can deliver that. But we, it won't just be renewable technologies that everybody's familiar with, solar and wind, it's biomass power, biomass heat, um, anaerobic digestion, how we use waste, how we then look at how our homes can play a role as being little virtual power stations, as well as the opportunities, and I say opportunities, for industry to play their part. But we do need a whole alignment of policies, regulation, business rates, taxation, to really get that, that whole process going. And over this last summer, just to, to find the final points, we work very closely with the government 
particularly under COVID-19 circumstances. And like everybody else, I think everybody's put forward their 10 point plan of how a green economic recovery can really happen. And as a pan sector in terms of power, heat, transport and circular economy, we came forward with our ideas of how we could move forward. And that's for the next 18 months, two years. But then we also have strong views of what we need to be doing for the longer term, of how we can deliver a system of carbon capture and usage and storage, and also the green hydrogen agenda and the pathways to it. So in short, I think we can. So uh, I'm looking forward to answering anybody's questions on the minutiae of the details of the challenge of how we can do it. Thanks, Fraser. Thank you, Nina. Well, one of the toughest nuts to crack here is transport, of course. Uh, it's, if it's not politically plausible to tax the poor off the roads and out of the sky, you need to find better ways of finding um, ways of moving people around in a carbon efficient way. Tony Green at National Grid, and let's hand over to him now. Tony. Many thanks, Fraser, and thanks, everybody. Um, so, yeah, I am interested in the uh, decarbonisation of transport. My focus is, is largely on hydrogen and its wider uh, opportunities. And when we look at the, the conversations that have taken place on the, the previous panels, I think we're, we're all in violent agreement that um, tackling climate change is absolutely crucial, but the, the pressure is now on to really deliver. If we, if we look at some of the challenges that uh, lie ahead as we, we move towards net zero, We've got to focus on decarbonising our homes, decarbonising our vehicles and decarbonising heavy industries. As you said in your introduction, um, about a third of the emissions uh, come from our homes. Uh, that's 85% of homes in the UK use gas currently. And the transport sector amounts for around 27% of our, our emissions. Um, if we were to sex successfully decarbonise that pathway, we'd have to remove around 27 billion litres of, um, of diesel uh, from the market today. So as the um, gas transmission owner across GB and uh, the electricity transmission owner in England, we recognise we've got a, a real responsibility in facilitating this shift. Um, we're exploring how we can use technologies such as hydrogen, um, and I will say in both its blue and its green form, as was mentioned earlier, and carbon capture and usage to decarbonise industry buildings and, and the heavy transport space. And we're supporting on the decarbonisation of a number of the clusters that uh, the Minister uh, mentioned earlier on. But in order to increase the reach to the whole country, we're also looking at how we repurpose existing assets, such as the gas transmission network, to carry hydrogen, um, as we believe this will actually reduce overall costs of a transition to net zero and really open up opportunities to look at energy as a whole system. Um, particularly as we look at hydrogen as a storage vector for renewable electricity generation. And I think it really helps that we've got this unique view across electricity and gas and it's um, all of its connotations, um, whether it uh, be blue or green. Um, and one of the things we've got to really remember here is that we've got to bring consumers with us. Um, the, the energy transition has got to be done with people rather than to people. And so, some of our research that we've done uh, recently really illustrates that people are really not aware of the, the, the nature of the energy transition and the impact it's likely to have on them. And as we've um, spoken to them, it's, it's become very apparent that we need to really educate more people um, as to what the needs are. We need to look at more in the way of energy efficiency and work towards that whole net zero. So we've got a, a really exciting time ahead. There's an awful lot to do, and uh, we're, we're here to support that. Great, Tony, thanks very much indeed. And finally, delighted to be joined now by Lord Debden, the Chair of the Climate Change Committee. Well, thank you very much. And I'm sorry I couldn't come before, but I was busy doing exactly this with the water industry, because this is a moment in which we're, I think, making the best of what would otherwise be a disadvantage and talking uh, much more decisively about some of the real issues that uh, with with which we're faced i can't help but picking up on anthony green's comment to start with because um it is absolutely true that the energy industry has to take the public with it 
but the difficulty is that the public has a connection with the energy industry, which is largely unsatisfactory. I mean, if you look at any of the surveys of customer satisfaction, the connection between the uh, uh, utilities that serve us with our energy and the public is terrible. And I've often had to say, look, we're not going to take the public with us until, um, uh, and I'll be frank, uh, until NPower answers the telephone. It, it, it's a fundamental issue about how we connect with um, uh, our customers if we are going to try to make these changes effective. Um, and one of the things we have to do is to connect. The second thing we have to do is actually to speak in a language which people understand. I've banned the expression um, kilowatt hour from uh, the Climate Change Committee, because I don't believe anybody really knows what a kilowatt hour is outside. So unless you talk in terms of people's bills, unless you talk in terms of pe what people know about, you can't expect them to be taking seriously what we're trying to deal with. Um, and, and that's because we are all interested in this. We're all keen on this. We are people who who uh, spends our lives doing this. But we're dealing with the public, which has got lots, lots of other things to do, things that they think are better to do. And so we have to find a, f a formula for reaching into those lives so that they understand and uh, realize insofar as they need to uh, take their part in what is a, a national and international endeavor. So uh, for me, I start with the communication element because I think otherwise we're not going to be able to answer some of the other tough questions, questions which indeed, uh, uh, Fraser, you've uh, put to us. And so at one end, it's how do you get the mass of the public to recognize the issues and to realize why everything from energy efficiency to some of the new techniques are going to be necessary. The other end, we have to ensure that the difficult industries, the ones which really have a problem, uh, very heavy users of uh, energy, how they're going to overcome their future and uh, uh, overcome their problems uh, in a way which contributes to the future of all of us. Um, and I do find it difficult sometimes. People talk about some of these industries as if there's something nasty about them. Um, if you want to make cement, it does take an awful lot of energy. Um, the cement industry has to try to make it less energy intensive. We need to find alternatives to cement wherever that is possible. And wood is, for example, in many cases going to be much more widely used. But in the end, we're going to have to have a cement industry. And if we're going to have to have that, then we've got to find an energy answer to that. And it's a mixture of the industry itself minimizing its demand and us discovering ways and you mentioned uh, the issue of hydrogen that may be one of the ways ways in which the uh, clusters of heavy industry can be uh, can be satisfied in a uh, zero carbon way that's why the Climate Change Committee has been so tough about saying that carbon capture, storage and usage is absolutely essential. And why we do think there has to be a demarche in the uh, hydrogen direction, even though we don't necessarily know whether it can be done in the way which we hope it can be done. Clearly, at the moment, it's uh, very expensive environmentally to achieve what is supposed to be an environmental answer. We've got to find ways of producing it in a way which is not like that. But we can't ignore it. Uh, we have to accept that it is one of the possible ways in which we can solve the real problems that we have. And again, it's not either or, it's both and. 
One of the problems I think we have in the whole of the energy industry is that people get very enthusiastic about their particular bit of the energy industry. Whereas what we really need to have is a very much better and wider concept where people are working uh, all to, uh, uh, together and, and dealing with uh, things as part of a whole. And uh, the last thing I want to say um, is simply this. Uh, Climate change won't wait. We have a, uh, a, a need to deliver on zero carbon by uh, net zero carbon by 2050. Uh, we can do that and we can do it in a cost effective way. But we can only do that if we are actually doing it now and not tomorrow. We are actually carrying this through. And there are a whole series of simple things which need to be done and which the energy industry ought to be very determined to insist on. We have to stop building houses that have to be retrofitted. The government has now allowed a million houses to be built which have to be retrofitted because their energy uh, demand is far too great. We've really got to stop infrastructure projects which don't understand that they have to contribute to net zero rather than make it more difficult. We really do have to make those decisions. The government has at the moment put out, for example, a discussion on, uh, on planning changes. If you read those planning changes carefully, you'll see that it, they don't take anything like the required necessary steps to deliver net zero by 2050. They are lacking in very fundamental changes which are necessary. And so when we talk about the energy industry, we're talking about an industry which will be relying on all sorts of changes which need to be made elsewhere. That doesn't mean to say that it should sit back and expect others to change. It needs to be part of the campaigning mo mode to ensure that the parameters within which it has to work and develop and expand are actually those that make that development, that work and that expansion possible. John Gummer, Lord Devon, thanks very much. And let's go now to audience um, questions. All right, Tony, first question from you, from Adam Little. Um, very interesting what you're saying about hydrogen, but isn't it the truth that we've just simply missed the boat with hydrogen, um, and given that the industry is focusing on electric vehicles? This, lots of investments have been made, the consumers have decided, the hydrogen has just simply come along too late to pick up in a significant way. I, I think the answer to that is no. Um, from a vehicles perspective, the electric vehicles are very suited to the, the smaller types of vehicles, but for heavy goods and particularly passenger transport, and as we move on into say maritime or um, aerospace, hydrogen presents a, a very different option and a, a, a much better storage vector. Batteries are very heavy. You move into heavy goods vehicles and the performance is not so great. So we're, we're looking at, um, the, the options for hydrogen in that space and particularly green hydrogen, uh, the more pure form of hydrogen feeds very, very well into that. And if we can actually start distributing that through our networks, it starts to change that entire vector. So you can fill up a, a hydrogen vehicle in minutes in the same way as you can fill up um, a car or a vehicle today. Uh, if we can distribute that hydrogen around, you'd be able to fill up your car in a hydrogen way in a very, very similar fashion. So I don't, from a transportation point of view, I think we're just seeing the start of the decarbonisation. You've got electric vehicles out there now. I think there is an opportunity for hydrogen to still play a role in that space. But there's, there's a much bigger role of, for hydrogen in decarbonising industry, for decarbonising heat as well. So I think transportation is, a, is, is an additional piece, um, but there's the more traditional markets that we've, we've got that we can decarbonise as we go. Thank you, Tony. A question now for Nina Skorupska. It's um, from Nick who asks, do you think that heat pumps are the answer to decarbonizing heat in households? We've seen quite a lot of development in those recently. Um, some countries in Scandinavia, they're everywhere. Do you think this is going to be the next big thing in British um, energies, domestic energy supply? 
Well, if you look at um, the areas that the government have made some positive um, uh, statements of how, what they want to do to help decarbonize homes, heat pumps is one of the, the important technologies. And, but then the, the, the marrying of them of, with our existing housing stock makes the decision to use them um, a little bit more tricky. Um, there are other forms of decarbonizing our housing stock. Obviously, the first one is um, the energy efficiency improvements, as Lord, Lord Deben has mentioned, that all our homes should be made as energy efficient as possible. And then once that's done, then you, you'll find that heat pumps, whether air source or ground source, depending on the type of um, building uh, housing infrastructure that you're, you're considering, then they, they play a very important role. But for some other areas, homes that are not connected to the, the gas network as we see, um, there are other solutions. So like for instance, uh, biomass heating, you know, it's sustainable, good with uh, good air quality, also renewable, um, low um, petroleum gas, it's not petroleum, but renewable gases that can go in and displace oil heating. I think as, as we, as um, John had said earlier, it's not an either and all, we need all of these ways of uh, transforming and decarbonizing our homes uh, because it is one of the biggest challenges that we're going to be facing for sure. Uh, electrification plays its important role as well. So some homes with uh, solar panels, very energy efficient, energy storage, so that those prices are coming down. So it, it's not as we previously thought, if you only heated a house uh, with electricity, that uh, this would be the most expensive way of doing so. The whole of the understanding how we can make our homes energy efficient and affordable is turned on its head with the advent of these new technologies. Okay, that's um, John Gummer, Lord Devon, a question for you from David Kane. Um, as an island, an obvious source of green power for Britain would be the tidal and wave generation, something which your committee doesn't seem to have focused on very much. Is that because you just simply don't think the technology is going to be there? Or could this be a trick which you're missing? Well, I hope we've not missed the trick, but I can't resist in saying that the my air source... Um, a heat pump goes in on Monday uh, and our uh, heating here will be uh, zero, I hope, when we replace LPG with uh, uh, biogas. Um, uh, so I'm a total committed uh, person to heat pumps um, and I believe we can see very, many much one if, as long as they are used in a hybrid sense um, and as long as people, as long as we get as long as we get simpler at explaining what they are, I come back to the point about making making things accessible to, to everyone. As how how would you describe a heat pump then? I mean, go on, you're stopping a guy in the street. How would you persuade him to get a heat pump? Well, I would simply say that if you, if I'd ask you first of all, how you heat your house now. Gas so, central heating? Gas central heating. Well, then all you need to do is to arrange through one of the many companies that will do this for you to install a heat pump, which will reduce your energy use and your costs and keep you warmer um, if you do that. And there's no better argument than to say you will spend less and the government helps you to contribute to do that by the hybrid, um, as long as you do it in a particular way. And so you'll be a few quids in over a few years. Oh, and how long do you have to wait, um, um, uh, you'll be asked, before you start to see a net return on this? Three well, years, five years? Uh, well, it depends entirely upon, um, upon your present situation. I know it's difficult to say that, but it, 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 we are talking about uh, a very much more limited amount of outlay and long-term savings. And if you gave me your details, I would make sure you could have an exact quote for that purpose. Okay, well, you, well any questions to um, go here? We can, sure you can come around your house anyway. Like back to the question about tidal power. Is, yeah. this, 
Uh, you know, per perhaps we'll be talking about this in two years' time. Well, we're, we look at tidal power very carefully. Um, I, I'm instinctively a believer in tidal power. It seems to be wonderful. You know when the tide is going to be. Before I became chairman of the Climate Change Committee, I was involved in seeking to have a, uh, a, a barrage in the Severn, which I still believe to be a really sensible way forward. Uh, the trouble is, at the moment, no one has come up with a cost effective way of doing this. The government has been encouraged to look at these. They haven't yet been able to see one in which the invest, public investment seems to be getting the kind of return. I have a problem with this, which is a personal problem, um, which is that I do think sometimes the, uh, the financial mechanisms which we use to measure some of these things seem to me to be out of date. Uh, if you said to the average father of a family, if you were, if you spent a bit more on your electricity now, your children could have free electricity, they would be very likely to say yes. They wouldn't say, well, I've got to apply a whole lot of uh, technical arrangements about uh, uh, net cost and various things before I could come to that conclusion. They instinctively think. That, uh, carbon, that, 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 uh, um, uh, that wave power uh, and that uh, barrages ought to be a good answer. And I still believe that we could do a lot more uh, to overcome the, the uh, financial reasons that have so far inhibited them. Okay. Um, Tony Green, a question for you from John Cattermull. Um, wh what do you, do you, where do you see the um, investment and uptake of fuel cell technology in homes as well as transport? Do you think that's going to be much of a, a factor in the next few years? I think it could be. And I, I, I caveat my answer here because fuel cells require very pure forms of, of hydrogen. Um, if we are to distribute hydrogen through our networks, the hydrogen by the time it arrives at a property is likely to not be of the quality that you need to drive a fuel cell. So I, I believe um, fuel cells will play a role um, if you have access to the green forms of um, hydrogen which would come from electrolysis. So it probably uh, fuel cells within vehicles probably suits um, fuel cells within sites where you can actually get a delivery of green hydrogen to it. But as regards um, fuel cells in the general um, population, that would be much more challenging unless we can come up with ways of cleaning the hydrogen to the levels that are needed for a fuel cell or we make them more robust. There's a lot of disruptive technology going on in this area. I was talking to a company only the other week um, that have developed a, a carbon level filter that operates at the 40 picometer level, which is absolutely minute. Um, and they're, they're getting very, very good levels of performance off that. So the opportunity for de-blending, uh, as I call it, um, hydrogen from a gas source is starting to emerge and it could start to get quite interesting, but we need that price point to come down. We, we, need, we need hydrogen into the networks to, to be able to, uh, to really see that. So I, I think fuel cells have got an opportunity. Uh, it's just how, when and where the, the right quality of gas and the right price point starts to emerge for us. Okay. Another question for um, John Gummer, it's from David Francis. Um, you seem to be quite upset with the government's uh, behaviour when it comes to the regulations on new homes. Do you think it's time to simply ban putting in gas central heating in new homes? Well, the government has committed itself to making that illegal from uh, 2025. I mean, that is uh, certainly already on the, uh, on the programme. No, what, 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 I, what I feel very strongly about is that um, the government at the time um, uh, reversed the decision to have net zero homes which had been put into the programme. Uh, the industry, uh, with one or two notable unacceptable exceptions, the industry as a whole had prepared themselves for that and then the government backtracked. So we've lost that whole period of time. What we're waiting for now, and we're still waiting, is for changes in the, um, 
uh, in the building regulations, uh, much tougher and higher demands. And also, uh, I believe that we should be tying into uh, the uh, work that we're doing in terms of uh, investment uh, into housing in a post-COVID world, we should be making absolutely clear that none of that investment will be done in homes which do not meet uh, a level which is somewhat akin, to put it carefully, to the passive house system, which of course means that you then give people a home which costs very, very little to heat. It's a very important contribution too to the reduction of uh, poverty and fuel poverty in the country. Okay. Um, a question for Nina from Peter Cutts. Uh, what potential do you currently see in domestic electricity storage? Is that going to be something we're going to be doing a lot more of, or is the technology simply not there for us to do it to any significant extent? Well, the, techno the technology is there now. And, and what it, the, the problem at the moment is, how do we make people aware? And also, how do we tackle matters like uh, level, leveling it up with other forms of technology? It's such an exciting arena of incorporating uh, domestic batteries, and particularly when some of the suppliers are looking at second-hand, second-life uh, electric vehicle batteries. So you, you start to see this recycling of, of components. So at the moment, for instance, solar panels and um, uh, home battery uh, systems are charged at higher VAT rights, uh, rates than um, anything uh, fossil fuels going into people's homes. So that's one example of how we, you would encourage matters like that. But at the same time, we've got to um, also open up the markets so that there are companies who are coming up with some fantastic innovative business um, uh, models who will act and pull together the, the generation or the battery storage, or if, the, if homes will have in the future electric vehicles, and we'll see vehicle to grid transfer of power, depending on the price of the electricity, you could see people's homes being a, an aggregation and creating virtual power stations. So the old models of how we look at the power market are being turned on their head in order for people whether they want to be actively nerd like, like I am about my home and my solar panels, through to the people who don't want to know anything about their electricity, but can trust companies will help them make money from the assets that they've invested in their homes. That's the future we're moving to. It's about the choice and being able to combine all of these different opportunities together to decarbonize our systems. But so. It's if here it's now. Asset, then isn't it a bit of a risk it becomes a depreciating asset? I mean, I don't know when you got your solar panels installed, you were probably an early adopter, were you? I, I installed mine in my, well, I, I'll tell you where I live now. I'm very fortunate. I live on the coast and I've got an apartment in a big, very old, creaky Victorian house built in 1845. And I have insulated the beep out of it so that my electricity because I have no gas here, my solar panels essentially have reduced my energy bill to only 200 pounds a year. And I've got a three and a half thousand square foot property. So I've, I've done those steps over the four years. I'm not an early adopter from 2011 when feed and tariffs were very high, but I've got the right balance. So at the moment, I'm looking at the next choices of how, you know, the tech because the things we've not talked about is um, what has changed in the last 10 years we've got all these wonderful renewable technologies but it's how they're combined and how they can provide that offering now into a modern system and that's the steps that we need to bring people along with people love their iphones and their ipads you know, all of this is going to be visible on there. I can look at my iPad and select how each single room is set up just because of the clever thermostats. So this future we're going into is not the building and infrastructure that we've had in the past, 
we've got to be able to embrace and take people with us to understand what solar panels, batteries, electric vehicles, heat pumps, biomass boilers in areas where it suits that building better, or biogas, hydrogen, all together, what is that future going forward? So but batteries are here now. They're not a thing of the future. They're here now. Right. But, but Tony, and um, this is another interesting aspect. People do love their iPhones, but they tend to get a new iPhone every couple of years. It's an expensive business if you're trying to keep up with technology, if it changes all the time, improves all the time, certainly. You know, we're at, but at an age of innovation. You can see, can't you, why somebody might think, okay, I love the sound of Nina's Victorian house. She pays 200 quid <laughs> a year. That's great. Let's go down to her and store. Let's get it down to mine. But at the back of your head, you might be thinking, well, if I waited for a couple of years, I'd probably get even cheaper and get even more energy out of it. So isn't there a sort of paradox that when technology is moving, you're talking about hydrogen, on fuels of technology, all kinds of innovation, that people are a little bit worried about investing in something that's going to get out of date pretty quickly? That's, that's certainly a risk. Um, technology is evolving. Um, it's evolving in the gas sector as, as well, though. Um, Baxi and Worcester Bosch have got hydrogen boilers now um, that are in their labs. They're, they're running on up to 100% hydrogen, and they reckon by 2025 they could be at market at volume and at scale. Um, so from the point of view of we're not going to have hydrogen available in the networks for a period of time, we could be in a situation where you could buy a hydrogen ready boiler from 2025 onwards. And as we start to be able to put green gas into the network, you can switch over to that. So technology is evolving very, very quickly. Um, we've got to go back to ultimately the customer and the consumer as we started in our conversation earlier. Co consumers are largely very ignorant as to what, what the options are at the moment. They know what they want. They want a, a warm home. Um, they want to be able to turn the cooker on when the cooker comes on. Um, so we, we've got to help them work through that process. What they are ultimately concerned about is the upfront costs, yeah. the impacts on their uh, ongoing bills, as Nina mentioned a moment ago, bills are obviously very, very important to them. So ultimately, we as the industry and government have got to help them work through uh, how do we remove those upfront costs and sort of de-risk the whole situation for them. I think... In investing in the whole energy efficiency piece we've discussed yeah. is, is absolutely critical. We've got to reduce the amount of energy we use and then the various technologies can start stepping in and it won't be one solution for everybody. I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm not hit, sitting here saying hydrogen's the answer or heat pumps are the answer or district heating's the answer. I think we're gonna see a mosaic of solutions. We've got to utilize that whole systems approach that Nina mentioned earlier. There'll be regional solutions that will suit different aspects of particularly our home stock. Um, Nina's home is a particular example. I live out in, the, in a rural community. It's a house built in the 1800s. It's very, very hard to insulate. So I need a different solution to, to Nina. If you're refitting a home, you can do an awful lot and a heat pump is probably the most suitable. But actually, if you've got a legacy home with no uh, wall insulation and so on, actually a hydrogen boiler might be the best solution because you're more limited on what your options are. And you can't afford to rip your house apart to fit a heat pump that needs more efficient insulation and more um, radiators or underfloor heating to be efficient. So I, I think it comes down to, you know, we've got to keep an eye on the technology going forward. And we've got to use the best solutions going forward. And cutting off one or the other doesn't necessarily help us. We need to keep the options open and do the best job we can at the time of the technology we've got. And some decisions we may have to come back on in the future. But <laughs> the key thing is we do something. We've got to be moving forward. Um, there's 20 odd million homes out there. We've got to start work on that soon uh, because the problem's just going to get bigger and bigger as we head towards 2050. Right. Um, uh, John Gummer, um, now you're, you're, you're eagerly awaiting the arrival of your heat pump on Monday uh, next week. Um, <laughs> but the thing is here that I don't know if, if you've got another, uh, but both um, Tony and Nina have got houses built in the 1800s. I'm not quite sure when yours was built. If you're, you're, um, 1843. Um, Seriously? So yes. just two years after Nina's. There we are. <laughs> yes, what a coincidence. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> right. OK, but, 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 but you guys are quite you know, enthusiastic adopters here, but you can see somebody 
sitting at home thinking to themselves, well, if I am going to fork out for this, shouldn't I wait for this, this hydrogen boiler Tony's talking about? Maybe that's going to be the answer. Maybe heat pumps are going to be very, um, very yesterday's technology. And the problem is not, people have usually got the budget to do this once every sort of 15 years. You know, the well, old saying, you only fit double glazing once, so fit the best. Yes. If you're only going to get new sorts of um, heating in, you want something that's going to last five years. Maybe it's just moving too fast. And the government regulation you talk about, maybe that is also struggling to keep up. There are many people right now in housing across Britain who've been told that the cladding that they brought to be more energy efficient, that cladding is the wrong cladding. They're going to have to take it down because it doesn't meet their regulations. They're going to have to pay lots of money to get new cladding put up. It's bankrupting lots of people. There seems to, the government just, technology and government regulation seem to be changing at such a massive pace right now that anybody who does stand to put significant amounts of money in upgrading a, a renewable energy to their house does stand to lose out simply by having a rendered out of date system. Well, of course, he also stands to lose out if he doesn't change, because the cost of not changing, the energy cost as cash, is very considerable. So let's not think this is a one-sided issue. And it's exactly the same with the issue of the laptop. When the laptop came in, there were a lot of people who said, oh, well, I won't buy a laptop now because the next laptop is evidently going to have X, Y, and Z. And then they said they wouldn't buy that one. And some of those people ended up with no laptop at all. I'm using a laptop which has worked perfectly well for uh, really quite a number of years. And I don't, uh, 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 but I had to make a decision at one point. I had to decide I needed a laptop and I was going to take what I could get there. Um, if I didn't do that, then I would not be able to join in the remarkable modern technology that we have today. So Fraser, of course it's a perfectly reasonable argument to have, and most people do have this concern and wish, well, perhaps I'll leave it for a bit because I may get something better. But uh, we, you don't get anything for nothing. And those people who aren't trying to do some of these things are paying through the nose for their energy. And so what we're trying to do is to make it easy for people to make the simple, small, and not very expensive steps, and then begin to say, well, perhaps I can make the biggest ones. Don't agree with Anthony, if I may say so. This is a house in which I haven't had to tear out all the old radiators and such like. By having a hybrid system with biogas, you can in fact deliver this uh, in a perfectly reasonable way, but it isn't as good as one would do in a new house with underfloor heating and the rest of it. All I'm saying is every new house can be built, not more expensively. The money can, any the little bit of extra can easily come out of the land price. Every new house could be built so that people paid practically nothing for their electricity and didn't make the emissions that they do now. All that needs to be done there is that the government sets those standards, not, not standards which demand you do particular things, outcome standards which say houses have got to be of this energy efficiency. We did that, um, looked the um, house builders in the face and said, you know perfectly well you can do that. You've always known you can do it. You said you could do it back in 2019. So let's get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Nina, sorry, do you want to? <laughs> yeah. I, I, really, I really support uh, what John is saying. Uh, when I joined as chief exec of the REA seven years ago, and I came back from living in the Netherlands, who at that time I thought was five years ahead of the UK in terms of addressing all of these uh, leveling up that people could enjoy uh, renewable energies and energy efficient homes. And they went for it in a big way, you know, with uh, heat networks involved and changing how heat networks that uh, heated the homes that were previously burning coal or gas, they would move into biomass or biogas. 
And I came to the UK and I thought, fantastic, 2016, we're going to be going to net zero homes. It was 2016 and it got turned on its head and it's been fraught that we're still battling that our homes, which even more today are our castles during COVID-19 when we want to feel safe, secure and warm, should be the most energy efficient. Our people and uh, in this country deserve it. So the Green Homes Grant is great, which we've just heard announced and I'm sure the minister mentioned it earlier, but it's again, six months to install energy efficiency, two billion, it's just not gonna happen. So we need some pragmatic views like John has said, all house builders now should be installing solar panels, so cheap as you're building a house, get them built, heat pumps in, gas networks that are going to be promising to deliver gas, uh, green gas, all of those things should be built in with that home. Three-phase power supplies, why doesn't the UK have as norm three-phase power supplies to the home so you can have a heat pump, EV charging and also solar panels to manage it? That's the kind of steps, changes that we need the building sector to move forward on to help us who want to deliver the renewable solutions to marry all of that in our infrastructure. Sorry, I had to get off my high horse just then. Okay. <laughs> or get on my million, high horse, should I say. <laughs> but you know, there are a million families in homes which the government of the time, a conservative government, have deprived of decent heating at a decent <laughs> price by going back on their commitment. Exactly. And that's the issue. And we cannot go on like this because every house that is built today, with very few exceptions, what happens is that the house builder hands on the cost of heating uh, to the house owner. Whereas the house builder should be reducing that cost of heating by building the house in a way which you would find it built in Germany or in, in, in uh, the Netherlands. And really, uh, talking about taking back control, the first thing we might take back control of is setting standards for our people which are of the same level as those of other Northern European countries instead of way behind and uh, not allowing our house builders to create uh, profits uh, which are based on uh, sums of money taken from customers, because that's what you're doing. You're giving customers a bill for the rest of their lives because you're not building properly. Well, Tony and Nina and John Gummer from your 19th century um, homes, thank you very much for um, joining me today. And, um, it's, and thank you very much, National Grid, for sponsoring our summit, which is now at a close. We're going to be having all of our discussions up on our website. You can watch them again at any point on Spectator TV. So we, we've covered so much ground today. Um, so much is moving. I'm still not quite sure whether to get my own water pump, um, like <laughs> um, John Gummer, or whether to to completely get my 200 pound to build solar panel thing like Nina, but I'm sure there are um, lots of options and lots of food for thought that we've had in today's fascinating um, conference. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to all of our speakers today. And thank you once again to National Grid for sponsoring our summit. Thank you. Goodbye.